Hello and welcome to Angry Andy Reviews and this is my belated review for Black Widow. So, I've had a lot of time to really sit and consider Black Widow. Probably too much time in terms of trying to crack that wonderful YouTube algorithmic tesseract, as it were. But I feel like it was important to really hold off and carefully regard everything about the film. And indeed, this will feel less like a review and more like a, an evidential analysis part informed by my peers and close friends through honest discourse over the last couple of weeks. I will honestly say straight up that while I did enjoy this film to a degree, I was totally engrossed in the opening 30 minutes. I tell you that, you know, hands down, the opening 30 minutes were perfect for me more so than anything else in the entirety of the film. I found really, really significant issues with this film. Significant issues, not least with the god-awful accent from Ray Winston, which, oh, <laughs> it, oh, it makes me feel ill just thinking about it, just thinking about the accent. Or the completely and utterly wasted, reduced to henchman status Taskmaster. Okay. Honestly, who, who thought using Taskmaster in what amounts to a mindless drone in a bit part obvious twist role was a good idea? What an absolute chuffing waste. You can see the bloody twist coming from the first utterance in that one bloody scene that I won't spoil, but... Christ almighty, if it wasn't obvious enough, Olga Kurilenko's bloody name appears in the title credits, for Christ's sake, and any film fan would immediately go, hang on, I haven't seen that lady from Quantum of Solace in the trailers. I wonder who she could be playing. Ah, oh. And that, for me, is honestly what I did in the cinema. I, 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 just, I saw her name and I thought, hang on a minute. Oh, she's playing Taskmaster. Okay, not a disaster, but there's no surprise. The surprise is gone, and unfortunately, that was echoed by my good friend, Mr. Dan of Spider-Dan and the Secret Boars podcast. The name in the title credits was enough to ruin the, the, the rather flimsy twist. I mean, it, it gives you nothing. If you see that and you're immediately aware of that and you put two and two together, it blows the twist out of the water. And I guess I kind of have actually spoiled that for you and I apologise. Sorry. I feel bad for her though, um, Olga Kurilenko. Taskmaster is a gift of a character, but this film has her stand in a corner looking like a lost motorcyclist at the Isle of Man TT race. And when she takes the helmet off, all she's allowed to do is channel her best vengeful, silent, burnt victim acting. <sighs> Alright. Where's the charm? Where's the wit? Where's the macabreness, you know, that you see of this character? Where's the skeletal mask? It's, it's plain. It's boring. It's not what we know and love. And yes, I understand creative license, and it's perfectly fine. They've done it right the way through the MCU. But this is a character. You, you we're delving into the realms of the mystical, the crazy, the alternate worlds. We've got bloody aliens in this thing. In a universe where we have wizards and aliens, they bloody bottle it with Taskmaster and reduce Taskmaster to an ineffectual goon who wears ill-fitting motorcycle gear. It's not obvious at all that the misdirection, you know, of having a geezer as a stunt double was designed to protect that flimsy twist. I mean, we have seen the promotional sort of pictures of the stuntman in it, and it's like, okay, you were trying to misdirect us, but it, it just, it doesn't work. It absolutely doesn't work. Not only that, but we're told all the way through the film, 
of Taskmaster's incredible ability at mimicking everything, and yet, apart from the excellent but really, really brief fight near the start of the film against Black Widow, we see very little of it, bar a few poses that reference Black Panther or the Winter Soldier famous knife flick that he does in, in, in Captain America Winter Soldier. The rest was a predictable mess of shaky cam nonsense that exposes the sheer fact that the choreography has taken a nosedive in these films. <sighs> the choreography in Winter Soldier was so slick and fast-paced, you know, they even used, you know, wide shots so you could see the ferocity, the sheer speed of the fighting, and in this film it's all tight, which is great in certain circumstances. It worked really well in Batman Begins, but that was because he was learning his craft. Here we have Black Widow, we have Taskmaster, who should be these super, you know, fighters. And yet everything's tight. They have no confidence in the choreography. And it shows if you really sort of look at it. The problem is, for me, is fundamentally this film unashamedly copies almost every story beat to Winter Soldier. It's, it's practically copy and paste and if you take umbrage with that look at it simply the formula is black and white it's yet another film where an important object is kept from the clutches of some geezer who runs a secret organization once connected to hydra where the final conflict takes place in the sky on an airship base where the henchman is a drone except this time the connection between that drone and the protagonist is flimsy at best because the connection between them is utterly shoehorned in. I mean, Winter Soldier came across as a tragic figure and had relevance and meaning because of the connection to Captain America himself. Both Bucky and Steve were best friends and Steve failed to save Bucky from apparent death, even with all of his strength and his speed. He couldn't save him. Here, we get a brief setup of reasons to suspect, and the payoff falls flat. A, because it's too obvious to paint as a twist, and B, because they have no through line connection to justify Romanoff's actions in her desperate bid to save this character. Sure, Taskmaster is a victim. Sure, Natasha feels remorse for her actions in you know, doing what she does again, trying to avoid the spoilers, but but this has never been never been explored before in a character, never mentioned, and this is the fundamental problem with this film. Too much feels shoehorned in, in that it effectively makes several moments in other films feel completely, well, wrong. The most egregious for me, and as I was talking with uh, spider Dan. Spider Man the Secret Wars podcast, and it really, I hadn't really thought of this until he mentioned it. Is in Endgame, Romanoff states that she never had a family and never knew her father when the Red Skull probes into her mind and says her biological father's name. Well, hang on a minute. According to this film, yes, you never knew your father, but you did have a family. Okay, an adopted family, but it's still is a family that you accept, that you take under your, your sort of loving and affection <laughs> by the end of the film. You acknowledge as much before the bloody credits roll in this film, and the Red Skull would have known she was lying here, or at least trying to cover up some facts, purely on the basis that he has delved into her mind, into something that she doesn't know. He knows everything. He's become this really ethereal being. Trivial, you say? Okay, fine. But continuity in these films matters, especially when they are forcing in a prequel movie about a character that has hidden her past more than Clint Barton. You cannot obliterate future events and meaning in films that chronologically supersede this film just for the sake of a made-up emotional payoff. It doesn't work. These characters end up looking false. Their reactions end up looking false. When you go back and watch these films, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. I, yeah, okay. 
they've altered things in the past before they've changed story directions and admitted omitted certain things but that's been a progressive thing along as these films have gone along they've kind of let things slip away not bothered to go with other things but this is a prequel that takes place before Infinity War and they're changing fundamental things that go on from Infinity War into Endgame <sighs> <laughs> continuity is logically hard here and they barely scrape by some of the biggest head scratching moments for me in logical terms and when I'm talking logic here I'm not talking about what other commentators have said about logical leaps in that she should have died at least eight times I can live with that because both Bourne and James Bond have survived similar if not more outlandish attacks but I'm talking about real world logical repercussions that these films have dealt with before that expose the really poor writing in this film. Melina, quite honestly, is a bloody criminal, openly guilty of abducting young girls across the globe, subjecting them to chemical abuse and torture. She has a change of heart and is uh, forgiven. Okay. Allowed to swan off to God knows where to live happily ever after. Really? She should be arrested! Or at the very least encouraged to turn herself into General Ross who appears at the end. She... I mean, she also abuses animals, but no worry, pal. See you in a future TV show, because we need to leave it open for every bloody bugger these days, don't we? I mean, Romanoff herself was brought before the courts of the world for less in Winter Soldier. You're, you I mean, oh, they even say if you do this, <laughs> Winter Soldier, they say to Romanoff, if you go through with this, all your secrets will be exposed. Well, according to this film, everything's still a bloody secret. All right, <laughs> family's still a secret. Right, nobody knew about them. Fantastic. Ah, oh, plot, writing, continuity. Oh. Every time I think about this, and again, Dan said this to me, there's just more that comes apart when you think about it. That's, that's the unfortunate thing about this film. It starts off so well, and it, it literally flitters away. The Red Guardian, quite literally, <laughs> this is, this is uh, the rescue of Red Guardian, this is, quite literally results in the deaths of everyone at that Gulag prison base as a result of that avalanche and no one bats an eye where is the fallout for actions in this world anymore <laughs> i mean the sokovia accords were a reaction to you know mass amounts of death accidental death this they purposely oh i mean yeah okay it's accidental but they don't bother trying to save anyone else that's running away you know any of the innocent guards who are just working there for a bit of cash no problem they're all communists. Kill them all. Why not? I mean, the final battle as well, which plays out in CGI splendor like the end of Die Another Day, results in a floating fortress smashing back to Earth. The collateral damage huge, and yet nothing. Everyone just hugs it out and floats away along their merry journey to avoid the clash of their existence being revealed in Infinity War so they can be explained away in absence because they were all blipped, obviously writing I mean this this is part of a wider MCU issue that I have started to notice whereby the ramifications of the heroes dealt with so brilliantly like I said in Civil War are once again left to dissipate one division is the best example here. Wanda holds people hostage for bloody months under mind control and is simply allowed to leave for the purposes of future instalments. Writing. I mean, I get it. If they are not, if they address it further on, along the line, remember Civil War Two or something like that, I will take back everything I have said so far. But the sheer fact that they're not, and it's just for the purposes of progressing that plot to let them disappear, to not let them, to let them escape the ramifications. You can't set something up in a world where you make people suffer because of their ramifications, only to retract it just because they managed to save the world. You have to have some form of justice 
in this. I mean, the atrocities they're, they're doing at the minute are far worse than the atrocities that happened because all, the ha all that happened with the Sokovia cause was accidental. They were trying to save people. With Wanda, she just, you know, goes a bit crazy and decides to take everyone hostage to create her own idyllic world. I love that series. <laughs> but it's a massive bloody plot hole. If you're still with me here, and I'm glad you are, and I'm very thankful you are. I do not like dunking on this film, because, like I said, I really did enjoy the first 30 minutes, where it was tight and compact, like a classic spy thriller. The grounded elements were all there, and I thought, this is what we needed. A really tight and gripping, real-world level spy thriller. And the performances were great, smart, funny, especially from Florence Pugh who absolutely steals the limelight. It works. Scar jo is still the true master here, but she's aware enough in her performance to allow Pew to shine. And that is mature, respectable, given what, where, where all this is likely heading. Ray Winston was there, all right, perfectly fine, until he opened his mouth and revealed his supervillain plot, which I still don't really get, nor do I get the the red mist MacGuffin and how it came to exist but both were just a means to an end which bore no real tantalizing fruit wait wait what was going on with the pheromone MacGuffin plot armor <laughs> my word no I can't I can't I'll let you think about that one oh, I'll let you you can tell me that was a great moment, if you can. Uh, <laughs> she could have just walked back out the door and, you know, the pheromones probably would have wore off. Uh, <laughs> would it not have been better for Scar Jo and Pew to simply be chasing ghosts of the past like a hybrid born Indiana Jones flick whilst they are being hunted by a mysterious being in Taskmaster who simply just wants to fight the best of the best before they are locked away as a result of General Ross and the Sokovia Accords. It, it feels like for me that ultimately they utterly bottled the second half of the film, were scared to maintain that ground level feeling of in favour of yet another uninspired spectacle finish, and a villain who is arguably one of the most forgettable to date. I mean, I can't remember any of the lines that Ray Winston bloody said because I was too busy trying to figure out what his accent was and, quite frankly, I just didn't care. And that, for me, is the biggest shame of all. I bloody love Black Widow as a character. I fell in love with that character in uh, Iron Man 2 when she's kicking ass. I fell in love with that character even more in Avengers. And then all the journey from there was superb, leading, leading up to Endgame, and I thought, this is it, this is the film that should have been out years ago, and we finally got it. I love the mystery, I love the lore of her character, in the change from villain to hero, but funnily enough, this film still tells you bugger all when you actually think about it. Black Widow, for me, ultimately feels just as a, just as shoehorned in as Captain Marvel did. Great at the beginning, and great at being a mid-tier adventure, but poor, really poor actually being a Black Widow solo journey that changes the paradigm of what we fundamentally thought we knew about the character. And that ultimately hurts more than anything to say is that I am disappointed by this film. And it's a great shame. It really is a great shame. Like I said, I was very much into this film at the beginning. I thought, okay, we've not got a James Bond film until the end of the year. This is where it's going. I like it. I've got a strong character. A character we all know, we all love. And it just... <clears throat> yeah, the Moonraker references were there. But maybe it was a bit too much Moonraker. I don't know. Maybe that's just me being a grumpy modern man who didn't really like Moonraker. I don't know. I love James Bond. Moonraker is not my favourite film. And clearly, a lot of the influences from Moonraker from the Roger Moore kind of era was filtering into there. Yeah, maybe it's just that. Maybe I just couldn't get it. But, hey, at least we got the origin of the vest she wears in Infinity War. Absolutely terrific. Thank you very much for watching. I will be giving this, unfortunately, a mid-tier 5 out of 10.
Change my mind. Zero hour change. Uh, never done that before. But literally, upon edit, I realised it's not a 5 out of 10 at all. It can't be. It's not that bad. It's not that bad of a film. Yes, I have lamented a lot in this film, but it's not 5 out of 10. It is still mid-tier level. Okay, but it's a high. I say high. It's a 6 out of 10. It's got to be a 6 out of 10. It's got to be that high mid-tier area. So I'm going to go with 6 out of 10. I've immediately retconned my own score. Lambast me all you want, but thinking about it in terms of what I've said and what I did actually enjoy, it is about that 6 out of 10 level. Should have been more though. Should have been more. It should have been a much better film than that. But yeah, 6 out of 10, so translate that to what? three and a half stars out of five if that's the way you work it that's okay mid-tier ground yeah there you go okay now i'm going bye